Okay, I think uh, we can begin with whoever's signed in for now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to week two of your classes in your second year here, uh, or third year here, sorry. Uh, I'm also teaching the second year, so <laughs> it's a little bit confusing sometimes. Uh, but yeah, welcome uh, to your third year for those of you who are doing the whole program. And uh, for those of you who are taking specific classes, welcome. Um, so before we um, go do a small recap of what we did last week and uh, go into our reading for today, um, I'd just like us to open in prayer. Is there someone online who would be willing to open us in prayer? Okay, let's pray. Uh, heavenly loving Father, once in a Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord, as a team. The Lord, we are uh, from different parts, India and from abroad, Lord. I pray that you bless us. Speak to us, Lord, this morning, and let your word uh, always Lord, renew our heart, mind, and soul, Master. I especially pray for uh, your pastor, Lord, as uh, he is a uh, teaching, Lord. Let you speak through her master and anoint her, Lord, so that, Lord, whatever she is going to speak, it will not from her uh, words, but, Lord, it will through your uh, spirit master. I thank you, and I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, Subhashis. Um, That's very in line with what we're going to read in Corinthians today, to be led by the spirit in what you're saying. So thank you. Um, Okay, just let me figure out there's something my speakers could be um, are not set up correctly, I think. Okay, I think that should correct it. Okay, um, so um, I was just sharing uh, with uh, Jeffina who's here in person with us, uh, that I realized that being an online student can be a little difficult um, to fully stay engaged with what is happening. And um, yeah, because it's difficult to like watch a monitor and to keep listening and paying attention. Uh, I'm not sure what your experience has been so far, uh, but I really want to make it easier for you to stay focused and to stay engaged throughout the class. Uh, so I would really like it if, like when there's a Bible reading or if I'm asking a question, if you're able to respond that you uh, that you unmute and respond. Uh, if you are unable to unmute because of different, it depends on where you are uh, and this, yeah, your surroundings at the time. Uh, so I'm just going to ask if you are willing to read uh, or you're okay to unmute and talk during the class. Can we just put a thumbs up next, just so that I can see that, or I don't know if there's a thumbs up option or is raise hand the only option? Yeah, I guess raise hand is it. So you can just raise your hand and keep it that way throughout the class. Um, so I'll know that you are okay to unmute and then I may call on one of you to read the passage or something like that. Um, if you aren't able to read, then feel free to just leave that off and I'll know that you are unable to unmute. Um, is that clear? Yes, you can also like type in chat and say yes, or let me know if you're unable to read. Yes, so anyone who's okay to unmute at any point and you're able to um, speak during the class, please just choose that raise hand option. You can click on it now and keep it throughout the class. So click, on, click on the raise hand option that's on the bottom. Okay, so I think Brother Lubega is available to read. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Zelly Tony. Thank you. And 
Okay, so whoever, uh, so Sister Rosaline said that you're available at some point. So whenever you're available, just keep your hand raised. And if at some point you're not available, just remove that raised hand thing. So I'll just look at whose hand is raised so that I know, okay, they can read at this point. And if at any point in between you're not able to read, just remove that. Uh, you can click on the raise hand option again, and then it'll go off, right? Okay, thank you. So, uh, Jatina, you're available, I know. So, okay. Okay, so um, is anyone, um, we'll just do a small recap of what we covered last week in class. So we looked a little bit at the background uh, and a little bit at the culture uh, that surrounded the uh, letter that was written to the Corinthians. Um, anyone remember anything we talked about with regard to the city of Corinth? Yeah, just feel free to unmute and share. Um, I think they did. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So uh, we just saw how the Corinthian girls were known as prostitutes girls and uh, the connection between the Athens and the Corinth and how it's a coastal area and uh, Paul was being like a marketplace ministry over there how the current was a coastal area and uh, the, the current in religions also we looked at uh the upper low was in the lower part and i think aphrodite was in the higher part and uh, we also looked at how the temple prostitution was there and that's how the prostitution also entered into the church and Okay, okay, so Paul was almost doing a marketplace ministry. So there were lower class people who were avoided because mm -hmm. some of the Corinthians were really uh, knowledgeable or scholars or something like that. So Paul, Paul I really reached the utmost in the island. And we also saw that he spent 18 months in Corinth and then was one of his second missionary journey. And we also, we also saw about how Apollos came after Paul. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also one letter that is known in the Bible that he wrote. Okay. I think that's one well, of the introduction about Corinthians. Okay. So I think Jeffina covered uh, the main points that we talked about. Um, thank you. So we looked at the religious aspect, the um, the uh, uh, economical aspect, um, the geographical aspect of where Corinth was, and um, we looked at also uh, some other things about where Paul was in his mission missionary work when he wrote this letter. And yes, that this was not the first letter he wrote. He wrote a letter before this, and this was his second letter to the Corinthians. Uh, but this is the first letter we have in our Bible. So um, chapter one, we did up to verse 19. Uh, does anyone want to just give us a quick summary of what we did in those first 19 verses? Just maybe in two or three sentences, what were some of the main points we looked at? Okay, uh, Zeltoli, would you like to give us a quick summary of the first 19 verses? Feel free to look at your, to have your uh, the passage open and then you can share from there. Excuse me, ma'am. I cannot hear you properly. Okay. Um, is everyone else able to hear me okay? 
Anyone else having problems with? Just uh, you can even post it on chat and let me know if you're unable to hear me. If there's something wrong on my side that I need to correct. Okay, so Pash is said you can hear. Okay, Brother Rubika said you can hear me. Uh, okay, okay. Um, Central, it may be your connection, uh, your internet connection. So, uh, yeah, if if there's something that you can do to help get a better connection, then that may help. Um, because I think everyone else is able to hear me. So I was just asking if anyone would be willing to do a quick summary of the first 19 verses in First Corinthians, what we covered last week. Thank you. OK, uh, so Jeffy, that's a share. Uh, yeah, go ahead, thank you. Yeah. yeah, so in first Corinthians, uh, we did a study of verse by verse from verse 1 to 19. I think the starting is of it about the greetings, the salutation, the all things you recognize. And from verse 4 to 9, we recognize like what has did for us, uh, especially the grace, the special grace that he has given to each one of us. And I don't know, I just want to note like we also studied about uh, standing as a spotless being. I don't know how came up. I didn't like the verse. And then 10 to 17, we saw how we are actually called to be united uh, in Christ. And uh, we also see in Corinthians' background that they were actually divided according to their knowledge and religion. So Paul was actually talking about being united. And in verse 19 and 20, I think it was next with Isaiah 29, verse 13. That's what we had in our Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think it's just helpful to go back so that we remember what we were talking about. So even as we go into today's content, we're able to connect back to what had happened earlier in the letter. So yeah, some of the main things were the unity, um, because there was division in the church uh, based on which preacher they preferred, right? So some preferred Apollo, some preferred uh, Paul, some said they followed Cephas, and um, some said they followed Christ. So um, Paul is calling them to unity. And uh, we see a lot of this division was more based on their preference in the kind of, in the way the person preached, or uh, in what appealed to their own sense of wisdom. So uh, that was their uh, main criteria for preferring one leader over another. So uh, let's go to verse 19. I think that's we were somewhere. Uh, I think we finished 19 and 20, but we'll just read that. And then we'll continue from there on. So I'll just read 19 and 20. Um, it said, uh, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And so this uh, actually does a good job of just summarizing that whole issue of division uh, was over what they considered wisdom or what they appreciated as wisdom and uh, Paul is saying um, we don't depend on human wisdom but we go to the cross and that is where our hope is um, and so he's calling them to uh, put their faith in Christ and in the message of the cross rather than in the leaders who God had sent to them uh, to preach the gospel. So from there, uh, we'll continue into verse uh, 21. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Uh, so we see here that Paul is saying, God's wisdom is not to follow the wisdom of the world. 
right? He chose something that he knew people would consider as foolishness uh, so that people would have to choose to believe. They would have to uh, come to him by faith, not based on uh, what was impressive or, or what seemed completely logical or understandable or uh, what was presented to them in a very attractive way. It was not those things that were going to draw them to uh, Jesus. What was going to draw them to Jesus was the message of the cross. And if they put their faith in Christ, uh, that would be what saved them. And so uh, it's intentional on God's part to choose something that he knew would be difficult for people to, uh, to accept. Right? They were going to go against the wisdom of their culture and what uh, was valued in their culture uh, to go after something that uh, that would seem foolish to uh, anyone who's trying to grasp it with their own wisdom and with their own understanding. And so it was it did require dependence on the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who would have to give them understanding. It was the Holy Spirit who would uh, give them um, the ability to respond in faith uh, if their hearts were willing to do it. Um, let's go on to verse 22 and 24, 22 to 24. Can I have someone read that, please? Verse 22, for Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Yes. yes. So, thank you so much. Uh, so we see here that uh, Jews, uh, this version, so the NKJV says, Jews request a sign. Um, if we look at some other translations, it's Jews demand a sign. So it's not a kind request like, please show us a sign. It's more like, if you don't show us a sign, we're not going to believe. Uh, so that's the attitude with which they were coming to Jesus. And we see that even in Jesus' ministry, um, when he was going around and sharing, uh, calling people to the kingdom of God, uh, Although he was doing so many miracles, he was so often asked to show them a sign when he was already doing miracles. So it shows that it, they were not coming with a heart of like really wanting to see the power of Jesus. Um, they were asking for some kind of sign that uh, that that would satisfy their own hearts. But would they respond to that sign in faith? It seems doubtful because Jesus was already doing so many miracles and they were not responding to that. Uh, so uh, Jews demand a sign and the Greeks valued wisdom, which is what Paul is talking about throughout this. Uh, but we do not cater to what people are demanding of us. We will just preach the single message, which is Christ crucified, right? And that is uh, the message that is foolishness to the Greeks because you're following a leader who seems uh, seems like he was defeated uh, and seems like he was put to shame. And uh, to the Jews, it's a stumbling block because the Jews uh, always expected that God would send a Messiah who was going to uh, be a political leader, who was going to rescue them from, uh, from their oppressors um, in a way that was more um, like winning a battle. And so looking at Jesus on the cross, seemed counter uh, everything that they had expected. And so that was a stumbling block to them. So uh, the message that we preach about Jesus Christ crucified will not change based on our audience. Uh, we will preach the same message because that is where uh, our salvation is. That is where power is. That is where God's wisdom is revealed. Uh, and God's wisdom is not the wisdom of this world. God's power is not the power of this world. Um, and we see in verse 24, but those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So uh, we see the use of the word called here. 
Now, if you look in First Corinthians, that word is used a lot in chapter one. Uh, we see it in verse one, where Paul is saying that he's been appointed by God to be an apostle. Uh, we see it in verse two. Uh, here it's used more as the church is saved with the purpose uh, that they would live a life that is holy. Uh, we see it in verse 9, uh, where believers are called into fellowship within the Trinity. So we are invited into fellowship with the Trinity. Uh, we see it in verse 24, uh, that those who believe are the people who are called, where their spiritual eyes will be open to the power and wisdom of the cross. But those who depend on what they can see physically will not accept the gospel. So those who are trying to pursue God with their physical sight uh, and with their own wisdom will not be able to receive the gospel. But those who uh, are open to what the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to them, uh, those who are seeking something that is beyond their own uh, understanding, those are the people who will come to faith. And in verse 26, we've seen that those chosen by God uh, will be saved not because of their merit, but because of his grace. Uh, so when we use that word called, it's not that God calls some and he doesn't call others. Uh, the call is um, is described, uh, is described goes out to everyone, right? The gospel goes out to everyone. Uh, but there are a few who will receive it in faith, and there are a few who will reject it because they are looking for things uh, based on their own terms rather than willing to accept it on God's terms. And so the people who are called are the people who, uh, who are saved not based on what they have done or what they deserve, but because of God's grace. So those are the ones who are called and saved. Um, Let's go on to verse 25. Does someone want to read that? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Yes, and this is why we don't, uh, we don't move away from preaching the cross of Christ. Because although it may seem foolish to people or it may seem weak to people, um, what, is, uh, what is wise in people's eyes uh, is foolishness to God and what is the foolishness of God seemingly is much wiser than what we can understand. And what is the weakness of God on the cross is much stronger than anything that humans can understand. And so we will stick to uh, the message of cross because in that is true wisdom and true power. So we move on to the next part of this chapter. Uh, can someone read from verse 26 to 31, please? So you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Thank you. So uh, we go back to that verse 26, what we talked about uh, when we first uh, began discussing the Corinthians. So there was definitely a division based on status within the church. So there were some who were uh, from nobility, from uh, an elite background, and there were some who were the, uh, the manual laborers, uh, the local people who were from a poorer background or a lower status. Um, 
and we can see here that Paul is saying, not many of you. So there were these people who were from a noble background. There were people who were uh, who were of higher status, but that was not the majority of the church. And it may be because of how Paul chose to carry out his ministry doing the tent making. So uh, not many were wise, not many were white, mighty, and not many were noble. So God didn't call them because of their what they had achieved or who they were. God called them because of his grace. And so uh, when they were going back to fighting over Paul or Apollos or relying on their status or on the wisdom that was displayed in their preaching, uh, they were trying to go away from grace to say that human accomplishments are what we will find our identity in. Uh, so my identity is in Paul, my identity is in Apollos, uh, my identity is in the leader I follow. And uh, based on how impressive my leader is, then I can take pride in that. So that's a problem, right? Um, where we have moved from, I am nothing, uh, I don't deserve to be saved, but it's God's grace that has saved me and I totally rely on God's grace for salvation, to then finding uh, human uh, human accreditation for uh, our eyes, our sense of identity or our sense of pride. So this is where Paul is saying, this is who you were when you were saved. And it's so important to constantly go back to that, constantly go back to the gospel. Because when we go back to that time when we, uh, when we responded to the gospel in faith, we recognize that we responded to that completely completely out of dependence on God, knowing that there is no way I can save myself. There is no way that I can uh, live a life of holiness except by what Christ has done for me and except by the Spirit of God in me. Uh, that's, that's how we come to this place of salvation. And so to go back to that place constantly and remember this is who I am. This is the I, this is my identity as a believer. No matter how big we get in ministry, uh, no matter how many people are applauding us, how many people uh, are following us, uh, when we go back to that core of I am completely and fully dependent on Christ for my salvation and for everything that everything else that I do, uh, we can stay in a place of humility not get distracted by uh, not get distracted by the attention we are getting or the things that are happening around us, but constantly remain in Christ, fully dependent on Christ. Uh, so in this verse 26, we see um, he's talking a little bit from Jeremiah 9 because later on he's going to go uh, he's going to quote a verse from Jeremiah 9.24. So if someone can just turn to Jeremiah 9.23 uh, and read that. And then keep that passage open because we'll read verse 24 in a few verses. Jeremiah 9.23, someone can read. Jeremiah 9.23, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. Yeah, so we see um, the same idea that we don't find our glory in, uh, in human achievements, in uh, what we own, not in the material possessions that we have. Um, and so that's the same thought that Paul is sharing here in this uh, verse. Verse 27 to 29, uh, God has, just like God chose what he knew would be a foolish message to people, the cross of Christ, he also chose uh, what was foolish in the eyes of the world. That is, he chose the weak people. He chose the people who didn't have uh, a high status, people who were not considered important. Uh, he chose those kinds of people, uh, and he made them he made them great. He made them wise. Uh, he made them, uh, he chose them when they were 
of no importance to anyone else. God himself chose them. Um, and he gives them value. He gives them worth. So that none of us should glory to should try to take glory uh, when we are in God's presence, right? So verse 29, no flesh glory in his presence. So we don't go before God and uh, and take uh, and act like we have a glory that is separate from him. Uh, we'll look a little more at that use of glory and who true glory belongs to. But none of us can boast before God. None of us can um, glorify ourselves in God's presence. Uh, because when we recognize that we are nothing, God has made us who we are, uh, we recognize that he's the only one in whom we can boast, the only one in whom we can find glory. Um, verse 30 says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. Okay. So it says, but because of him, but because of God, you are in Christ Jesus. And Jesus became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So the only reason we are in Christ is because of God. Okay, that's not because of anything we have done. There's nothing that we can boast about in our own. Uh, about what we have done to be in him. And uh, Christ becomes everything. So he He is our wisdom, he is our righteousness, he is our sanctification, he is our redemption. More and more reasons why we have nothing to boast about. So if we are wise, it is because of Christ. If we are righteous, it's because of Christ. If we are holy, it's because of Christ. If we are redeemed, it's because of Christ. So to remember that Everything we are is because of Christ, because of the grace of God, and because uh, we are now in Christ, we can, we have all of these things. We have God's wisdom, we have God's righteousness, we have, uh, we are holy, we are redeemed. All of that is because we are in Christ. And then verse 31 says, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Uh, so, um, Sister, if you can just read Jeremiah 9, you read uh, verse 23. Uh, you can read verse 24 now. Jeremiah 9, 24. Jer Jeremiah 9, 24. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. Yeah, so uh, it says, Let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me. That is again uh, the same kind of thought that Paul is uh, communicating in verse 31. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So if we have anything to boast about, anything to glorify ourselves about, it is in God himself. So if we give glory, we give glory to God. If we boast, we boast in God. Because everything we are is because of him. And uh, like Jeremiah 9.24 says, that they have understanding to know me. So the understand, even the understanding to know Jesus comes from God. So because you, I can't even say it's because of my own uh, understanding or because of my willingness to depend on the Holy Spirit that uh, I have come to have come to faith and I can't boast in that because that understanding comes from God. Uh, so everything is the grace of God covering us through and through in this process of coming to salvation and then living out our faith in Christ. So with that, we can move on to chapter two. Um, I have here in chapter, in the beginning of your notes, that chapter two has been divided in a few ways. Um, so we won't, that's how we will kind of follow the notes. Uh, so it says, 
in verses 1 to 5, we're talking about proclaiming Jesus with power. Verses 6 to 10, uh, the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit who unveils the wisdom of God, who helps us understand the wisdom of God. Um, verses 11 to 12, uh, it's the Spirit who reveals what God has given to us through the gospel. What is it that God has given to us is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. And then verses 13 to 16, it is uh, the Holy Spirit who enables us to have the mind of Christ. Uh, so because uh, we are in Christ, the Holy Spirit then enables us to think like Jesus does uh, and to know the things of God. Uh, so that's a general division of this uh, passage. So let's begin with verses 1 to 5. Uh, anyone want to read that for us? Should I read, ma'am? Oh, sure, go ahead. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Thank you. So, um, Paul says, there was, I came to you intentionally, not uh, not with a uh, speech that was impressive or with uh, using a lot of rhetorical skills that I could have used. Uh, but I came to you just with this one goal to preach Christ crucified. So he keeps going back to that Christ crucified. That's the core of what we preach. Um, and so he didn't choose to use any... Uh, anything that would attract people to his words. Uh, rather, if he wanted to attract people to the person he was talking about and to the message that he was uh, he was proclaiming. And he intentionally chose a very simple way of uh, sharing it with the people. Uh, now, his reason for choosing that, he says... Uh, he says clearly in verse 5 that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he could have gone. He was someone who had been trained. He was a well-learned man. Uh, and so even in this letter, we can see how he is using, uh, how he is defending what he has said, what he's done. So he is using rhetoric. He is using uh, these skills of um of proclaiming something that he wants to say. But in that time when he took the gospel, there was intentionality in which he chose not to use that, that kind of language uh, because he wanted to uh, show people the power of God. So he, he preached very simply. And then along with that were uh, the signs, wonders, and miracles that accompanied his preaching uh, so that the message would be clear and simple for people to receive, but the power of the message would be revealed in what they were seeing as a fruit of uh, the gospel, uh, that uh, that people were being healed, that people were being delivered. Uh, so uh, both the message and the signs that followed uh, were important in his preaching. In verse 3, he says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Um, so it might be that uh, was a response to some of the challenges he was facing, because we see that there were people who were opposing him. Um, so when he is saying that he went in fear and trembling, it might be that because of the circumstances.
So we see there, so I'm just trying to scroll down. Yeah. So it says, uh, if we go back to Acts 18, where Paul's visit to Corinth is recorded, uh, it says, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision and said, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. So um, because he was facing uh, facing some kind of opposition from people, uh, it is possible that he um, he was afraid. And so when even though he continued to share the gospel, uh, he didn't um, he didn't have maybe all of that uh, power that may, Apollos had in his preaching. And Apollos was also gifted as a preacher, uh, separate from Paul's gifting. So Paul's gifting was, separate, uh, was different, and Apollos' gifting was different. Um, so when he says fear and trembling, it's possible that he was preaching in circumstances that were difficult. And so uh, his preaching also was affected by that. But then he goes on to say, verse 4, so my preaching was not with persuasive words, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. So uh, so when you think persuasive words, that word can also mean enticing. Um, so some philosophers of that age, uh, there were different views on this. Some of them would say, uh, if you're speaking uh, if you're speaking the truth, you don't need to have a very uh, convincing way to portray it because you know what you're preaching. And uh, if, if you're resorting to use uh, rhetoric or you resor resorting to use a very uh, like clear way of explaining and trying to prove to people that what you're saying is truth, then uh, they would look down on you. But there was another group of people who said, if you know the truth and you're not able to present it in a way that is convincing, then knowing the truth is a waste. So what Paul is saying is, uh, I know that I brought to you truth, but I was not depending on my skills as a preacher to convince you of the truth. Instead, I was depending on the Holy Spirit. So I was depending on the power of the Holy Spirit to convince you of the truth. So that's where... Um, the wisdom of God, of God is right. The truth doesn't need to come with. Uh, it does not need to be. People do not need to be convinced of the truth uh, by what we say, uh, but when they see that word working and impacting people, that itself will prove the truth of what we are saying. Uh, I'll just read a little bit from your notes, which uh, I really liked. This part says, uh, what you draw, uh, it is commonly stated, what you draw them with is what you draw them to. And so we don't want people to, draw, to be drawn to or to base their lives on human wisdom or anything like emotion, entertainment, hyped up marketing, etc. Our goal is to have people's faith established in the power of God. And so uh, when we take the message of the cross, we also want the power of God to be revealed. And we want that to be the thing that convinces people of truth and draws them to God. Um, so I think we just have a minute or two uh, before we take our break. Anything that you would like to share, any learning or any questions, anything that we've covered so far today? Nothing so far. Okay. Um, maybe we'll just continue with the next two verses, if uh, or the next verse, how much I will, we can complete before the bell goes off. So uh, verse 6, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. 
So we see here that Paul is saying, yes, we do preach a message of wisdom. It's not that uh, we are always going to preach something very simple and very plain. No, there are things that are going to be uh, filled with the wisdom of God. It's not the wisdom of this world, uh, but it will be the wisdom of God. And we will preach those deeper, heavier kinds of things to people who are ready to receive it. So it is to those who are mature. Uh, and we'll see later that Paul talks about the maturity of the Corinthians and whether they were even ready for such a message of wisdom. Uh, and the wisdom of God is a mystery which God ordained before time. So uh, this is something that God has revealed to us, uh, something that he had planned before time began. Uh, and now has revealed to us uh, something that uh, will allow us to share in his glory. So through the gospel, we share in the glory of God. And uh, that is what he has now revealed to us. So uh, it's break time. We'll continue from there uh, once you're back. So we'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.